quick. So, interest is really complex. It really is. This was just a very simple overview. Every single thing on a taxpayer's account affects that interest computation. If I might just talk yeah. about the Web Ruling 9940 real quick. We talked about IRS's computers before, right? It was Revenue Ruling 9940. So if it's number 9940, when did it come into effect? 1940. 1999. Backwards. Oh, okay. <laughs> right? It was a 40th ruling of 1999. Oh, right. 40th revenue ruling, yeah. Yes, revenue ruling. 20 years ago. So, like the interest netting, IRS's computers don't do this. Simply said, again, it's the use of money. A corporate taxpayer is overpaid in year one, that they credit elect to year two when that tax return. You know what a credit Everybody elect is, right? Credit elect is? Take your overpayment. The overpayment yeah. goes to the subsequent tax period. And what is that credit elect used for? An estimated tax payment installment for, for on the subsequent tax for period. It relieves you of having to make a payment or two or three or even four. Or part of it. Yeah. However, yep. you know, whatever your circumstance. Okay, so later in year one, you've got a tax deficiency, whether it's through an amended return or the IRS comes in and does an exam. So through the general rule, what did we say? When does interest begin on that tax deficiency in year one? Generally, due date of the return, right? Okay. However, think about it. The IRS has had the use of that overpayment from the original return, right? And that they've sent it to year two, that's just sitting there. So Rev Rule, Rev Rule 9940 says, wait a minute, that's not fair. Deficiency interest should not begin to accrue on that year one tax deficiency until such time that credit elect was needed in year two so as to avoid an estimated tax penalty in year two up to the amount of the credit elect. So that's what 9940 does. So when we analyze somebody's account, we say, okay, in year two, when did you need that credit elect so as to avoid an estimated tax penalty, meaning you did or did not make all your required installments for year two. So we analyzed that. So it's very possible that uh, somebody's um, interest could be suspended all the way up to the due date of year two. So you've got a year in there on which you didn't pay interest, right? But IRS's computers don't. They don't do that. So when Kathy came to be, uh, I think one of the first the very projects first that Kathy project won, was, yeah. a small bank, and it was just that issue, right? It was only that issue. And when I when I do an interest review on, on people's accounts, I do all their transcripts on all tax periods, all tax returns, whatever they've filed. We asked for 1970 forward from the IRS. Is it worth it? I mean, well, sure. how, much, the, how much did you get for that? That was 1.5. And they only wanted me to do their exam cycle three years. 1.5 million dollars. Million. Just yeah. can, Kathy, so, of course, the more yeah. you pay, right. you know, right. the relative so interest. What if, like, okay, you didn't find out this particular error, a couple of years down the road, right? Mm -hmm. So that year, like, so we have probably filed maybe 2015, 16, 17. So it has to be 2015. So you know that um, there's a, a carryover or estimated, estimated payment in 2016, and you use it already, and then can you push the day for the interest until later? No, you mean if you have a uh, credit elect that's going to go forward and go forward and go forward? Yeah, 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 something like that. You know, Not for 15. I mean, then if you had the same scenario for 16. And, and remember, you have to have a later deficiency in that first year. You have to now right. owe. Oh, okay. That's where that interest is going to be right. suspended. And then you, oh, okay. if you carry that initial credit elect forward, you, have, you would have to have a deficiency in each of the subsequent years in order for that to apply as well. Also, we work within the statutes of limitations. So, um, you know, we have to make sure that we're um, doing that right as well. Um, it gives you a flavor of how complex these rules are. I mean, really, it just is. interest alone that, that, that you can make a career on. Just an offset real quick. Offset is different than a credit elect, by the way. Let's say you're a corporation and you have an exam and you owe deficiency interest in 2015 and you're overpaid in 2016, what is the IRS going to do? Under 6402, 
they're entitled to take that overpayment from the exam in 16 and, and make it go back, offset it against the liability in 15, right? But I haven't seen any interest on that. But there well, isn't any. There yeah. isn't any. What happens if it's the opposite? They charge you interest. There's yeah. interest on it, right? If you're overpaid at 15 and it's going to pay a 16 liability, you've got interest on that 15 overpayment going to 16. Again, it's not always done correctly. I'm sorry, I could talk all night about it. That's why you're here. <laughs> so interest is, as we talked about, it's that charge. It's a charge. For not paying the IRS, or for the IRS not paying you, for sitting on each other's money. When you have a balance due, that's really what interest is for. Right? That is the cost to one party of having the money of the other. So part of the theme this evening is costs of not getting it right. When you've missed a deadline, you didn't do what you're supposed to do, or you did it kind of late, penalties address that as well. We're going to go over a whole lot of penalties in very quick little bursts, and they each address certain failures, right? That's it, behavior or failures or delinquencies or things that you did wrong. That's what these penalties are, are geared toward, okay? I call them penalties, most people call them penalties. Sometimes they're called additions to tax, okay? Um, because some out there think academically using the word penalty sounds like it's some kind of a prison term. They're really penalties, okay? Again, they could be additions to tax. Um, but our system, our voluntary system, promotes folks filing on time, meeting their deadlines. Um, and has a system in place to sanction cases where they don't. Civil penalties address a variety of these failures and behaviors, inaccurate returns, filing things late, paying late, what have you. Criminal penalties go after the worst types of violations. Criminal penalties can be very, very heavy, broad. It can also be jail. You can look at that as a criminal penalty for the most egregious cases. So, for example, tax evasion will be considered a criminal tax? Could be. Could be. There are criminal penalties and civil penalties. We'll get into the civil fraud penalty. That's a civil penalty, but it is a heavy one on fraud. Okay. So that could apply. Depends. Um, and we'll get to that. We'll talk about a case where you could have be looking at criminal and civil penalties as well. Okay. You can be looking at multiple kinds of penalties. In most cases, they don't stack, meaning the highest penalty will apply. And they used to. They used yeah. to stack before '86. Yep. But now they just basically say the highest penalty will apply to the amount. Um, some penalties can be assessed immediately by the IRS. So just issue a notice, boom, it's assessed. Some have to go through the deficiency procedures. So you give your notice deficiency, or like an accuracy related penalty, that has to be part of your notice deficiency. Then, of course, you have the opportunity to go to tax court or court of appeals, etc. Those can't be assessed immediately. You, have, you get the opportunity to go through those procedures. So there's differences in the way that the IRS can assess them. Penalties are generally not deductible. Okay. Let's start with the most egregious civil penalty. The first case I worked on at the tax court, actually, when I was a law clerk for the judge who I saw last Tuesday night while I was in San Diego. I was very excited, by the way. I was telling him all about the judge. Um, he was the U.S. tax court judge. When I clerked with for him a, a few years ago, um, the first couple cases he gave me were softball cases. They were both penalty cases. One was a negligence case and one was a fraud penalty. The fraud penalty case was a case where a taxpayer ran a Ponzi scheme. Anybody know what a Ponzi scheme is? Yeah, Ponzi <laughs> scheme. Yeah. He ran a Ponzi scheme and he owed tax. Well, it was really hard for him to say that he knew better or that he should be subject to like a softer, maybe kinder penalty like the negligence penalty. The court wanted to sock it to him. The IRS actually wanted to sock it to him because it was the IRS's proposed penalty court's role there is to agree or disagree with the IRS. IRS really wanted to sock it to him and said, listen, you were, you were running a, a criminal enterprise. That alone. That was before Madoff, right? Yes, before Madoff. <laughs> that reason alone, you should be subject to a fraud penalty. So in drafting the opinion for the judge, I upheld the fraud penalty, and the judge agreed with it. Okay. It is 75% of the underpayment that is attributable to fraud. That's a lot of money back on interest, it will go, it will well exceed the tax, if you do the math, it will well exceed the tax. And as we know, if you are subject to a fraud penalty, the return was pro had probably had fraud in it, right? And therefore, what happens to the statute? 
a standard for another. It never ends. Uh, never ends. So you, we, IRS could come in and say, hey, you had fraud in your 1990 tax return, no statute, charging you a 75% penalty plus and interest, interest, which compounds daily, as we know. Yeah. Could you imagine that invoice? Yeah. Well, you don't want to commit tax fraud. There's, there's the price of it. <laughs> um, but an interest, a, right, having interest stacks on that penalty. Yes, she does. What is fraud? What is fraud? It's the intent to evade tax, wrongdoing. First, you have to intend to evade, skirt your tax liability. Okay? Number one. Okay? Now, there is not going to be fraud if it is negligence or intentional disregard of the rules or regulations. That's a lower standard. Fraud is a very, very high standard. And Mrs. Stopper, what is, who has the burden in a fraud case, and what do they have to prove it by? The IRS would have. That's different in most cases. Yeah. Normally, who, who, who has the burden? Well, normally a taxpayer has the burden in proving things on their tax return except income. The IRS has the burden of proof. Additional income. Additional income, yeah. And they also have the burden of proving this, this penalty. And the standard is higher. It is not a preponderance of the evidence because we're talking about fraud. It's a big allegation. The government is coming in and saying, we think your tax return has fraud in it. Government better be ready to show that by clear and convincing evidence. Did you go into the badges of fraud? We might, or not? Yeah, we might have that on the next one. Yes, you can. Can a fraud case go to go, go to the Supreme Court? Sure. If it's if it's that, like, does it have the potential to go to the Supreme Court? Supreme Court, in, in just about every case, picks and chooses the cases it hears. Okay. You generally do not have a, a right to go there. You have a right to go to the Court of Appeals. Court of Appeals. So you start at the tax court or a district court or court of federal claims, whatever court you're starting at. Okay. You may have, this, this penalty may be an issue. Okay. Okay, it, it could be, if it's a tax court case, it's, it's, it's been proposed. If you're in the other courts, you've paid it, and now you're looking for a refund. After those first level courts, you always have a right to go to a U.S. Court of Appeals, period. It's after that, the Supreme Court of the United States generally does not take cases. They only take about 75 a year. And they will only take them when they, in a tax case, I will tell you when the government tells them to, and tells them this is that important of an issue because our courts of appeals are, are split, they don't know what to do, and so we think you need to weigh in now. Very rare, very rare. How is intentional disregard not fraud? Um, I'll give you an example, because we had this come up today. Let's say that the IRS has a regulation out there, and we don't agree with it. You don't have to agree with it. Um, and you might say, I'm taking a position that's not really in line with your regulation. We think that our position's better. I don't know that I'd say that's fraud. Mm -hmm. okay, I think you, you might be disregarding the rules. Mm -hmm. So that would get you there. Fraud is a difficult hurdle for the government to get over, but it can. And it can, and I think, here we go. I think, if you want to go over some of these? Yeah. Anybody know what the Internal Revenue Manual is? Yeah, it's Manual like a manual that, that, the, that the IRS doesn't usually yeah. follow. <laughs> That's their policy, their procedure, and how they, how they operate. Because they have to look for the badges of fraud, right? And they've got to prove uh, with regard to an exam that all of these happen, or most of them happen. Um, who, who within the IRS does this? What, is there a special group that does this? Are all their agents responsible for yeah, it? Yeah, they take the exam number and then they can forward it to criminal investigation. Right, and they're... An IRS person. Yes. And you, are you a revenue agent, officer, agent? So within, a, I don't know, if you're, if you're, are you general program? No, uh, just SBA. In general program? Uh, okay. And then also within SBSC, there's special enforcement program of agents who work with their criminal investigation division, and they go ahead and they develop these cases, and apparently they're very few. Yeah. So um, they some of their cases though can last five, ten years, <coughs> maybe even longer. So as Professor Simmons said, you know, once you're talking about statutes and you're talking about fraud, there is no no statute on that. So what are some of the badges of fraud that you, and you could have some combination of them. These are the things you'd be looking for. 
Yeah, I, I think the biggest one, in my opinion, when the IRS starts to look at this, and you know, there are different ways, there are different ways cases come to the IRS. Whistleblowing is huge. You know, you've got uh, perhaps spouses who are being divorced and one's angry at another, and you've got a neighbor who says, hey, how'd you get that link in, you know, and, and people are always, you know, turning people in. Um, the IRS looks at income. Right? And they're going to go through the taxpayers' books and records with a fine-tooth comb. They're going to find all their bank accounts and their businesses, their businesses that are perhaps named ABC1, ABC2, ABC3, that type of stuff where they may be commingling uh, uh, business operations. But it's typically the income that they're, they're looking for. And then, of course, they've got to go on to their other badges a fraud and then develop a case, then as Professor Simmons said, it can go ahead civilly and can be prosecuted criminally if it rises to that level. One example of, of, of income, and they can reconstruct your income. They can reconstruct your income. And one way is, is they see, as you're pointing out, that you've got your Lincoln, your Corvette, or whatever, that's what I would say. Um, <laughs> or, or you're living real high and you're reporting $40,000 a year of income. That's going to leave the IRS scratching their head a little bit. So they might want to come out and do a little math, right? Yeah. Well, well, what can Trump does that. Well, we don't know that for sure. But we've seen it with Trump. Um, <laughs> although I, I will say, as an aside, I, I'm scratching my head how they haven't gotten them yet because 6103, I think it's K, clearly gives the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee and the chairman of the Finance Committee and the chief of staff of the Joint Committee on Taxation just undisputable right to get these tax returns. Period. End of discussion. So I'm not sure why they haven't gotten them. We will see how that all plays out. Steve Mnuchin, right? What's that? Steve Mnuchin. The Treasury Secretary, Secretary can get them too. He will resist, but the statute doesn't say you get them only if. The statute is very clear. The chief, the, the Ways and Means Committee, Finance Committee, or the Chief of Staff of the Joint Committee on Taxation can get any tax return they want. We used to get them Joint Committee whenever we needed one. Time will tell. We'll see what happens. Uh, but they can reconstruct your income through a number of different ways, right? Um, they can look the at bank your bank account analysis. Look at your bank deposit. Yeah. Say, you've got a whole lot of deposits here, and you're only recording X number of income. That's one way. Now, how would they get those bank records? Summons. summons. What kind of summons would that be? Third party. Third party record keeper summons. Oh, there we go. We're remembering, see? That's it. They would get those bank records, and they would start to size you up. Say, gee. Mrs. Stopper, you've got millions of dollars in and deposits. Me. I'm an ignorant spouse. Oh. <laughs> oh. We'll go into that in a couple weeks. I'll make sure I'll be reminded folks of it. Yeah, bank deposits are one way. Um, there's a bunch of other ways they can look at your income. Um, so that, that that is the number one way. Other, yeah, oh, go ahead. So how does IRS know what kind of car you drive? They come out and make a look. Oh, or did you registration did you also? Yeah. Get up and yeah. Listen, they have databases that you and I are privy to. They can stop by. Yeah. They, have a look-see. They, they, they absolutely. And they do that. You, you even get back here and say 40,000 and then how would they suspect you have all this type of thing? Yeah, that's what we're Your address? They can look through, they can size you up any way they want. They could. So well, you've got so 10 So what kids. would trigger them to specifically look at that? Yeah. Help a whistleblower? Might do that. A hater, basically. Don't make any No, no, no. You need to have a supporting document enough to have to be a whistleblower. So it's not more than a hater. I think it's a professional. How would how the IRS know to pick you Those whistleblower referrals do come in and they are looked at. And they have revenue agents who take a look at it, do a quick look see, if you will of their databases and if um, some look as if they need further examination, they'll either do a cursory examination, say, yeah, now it looks good, fine, or they'll say, yeah, something's up here, let's look into this. So uh, they get thousands, thousands um, a year of those. And then a lot of them are done through normal exams. Somebody is just booked for an exam, you know, perhaps a small, um, let's say escort, and they're doing an exam and they're like, oh, I don't know, something's not right here, then they can also refer it. 
They could have a matching issue. Let's say somebody didn't pick up um, a 1099 or W-2. Yeah, it could be a number of things. And they, they, you know, losses are huge too. You know, how could you be living the way you're living and you're reporting these huge losses? Yeah. Got to be income somewhere. Yeah. That'll tip them off. And then once in a while they have these huge losses and and the individual will say, oh man, I had to use all the money I had. I, I had to put in $5 million last year to keep the business going. And he reported 40 on his 1040. And you're like, well, where'd you get the five million from? So things happen like that as well. And these are other badges, you know, that, that the IRS will look at in determining whether to um, propose a, a fraud penalty or assess a fraud penalty. Okay, you know, filing false returns, concealing income and assets, not cooperating. These are just badges of fraud that this court of appeals decided many years ago in what, what is really the case other courts always refer to when they're looking at a fraud penalty. When we were looking at the one way back when I was assisting the judge, we cited the Bradford case, at looking at badges of fraud in that case. When, when, when you're writing court cases today, you always go back and look at older cases and see where the best law is. You just draw from the Bradford case. That's really what agents will look at to see if you've got them. In the, case. the underpayment is what the 75% applies to, and that is the difference between what you report as tax and what you ought to have reported as tax. And that's really that differential. Um, now for joint returns, okay, um, if one spouse committed fraud, the other one is a ignorant spouse, as, you say. <laughs> as opposed to innocent. Yes. The firm is really innocent, not ignorant. But you're both, most of them claim they're ignorant. You're both jointly and severally liable for the tax, but only the bad actor spouse is liable for the penalty. Right. However, then if innocent spouse is in fact allowed by the uh, a party who did not commit fraud, then We go over innocent spouse in collection. We go over collection. So we're done with fraud. That's, again, that's folks who um, understate their tax return. With fraud, intent to evade tax. The more general penalty, this accuracy related penalty, is exactly what it says. Your return was not accurate. It wasn't correct. You got stuff wrong on your tax return. And the IRS gets a penalty for getting things wrong enough on your tax return. The accuracy-related penalty has eight, is it eight, prongs to it. This took the place of the negligence penalty. Yes, way back. Years ago. Yeah, they used to break them out in separate penalties back in 1989. Yeah, 88 or Yes. Congress put them all together in a neat little package and said 20% penalty. If you have any of these, reasons. Now, some of these reasons are newer than others. For example, this undisclosed foreign financial asset, inconsistent basis, these are brand new prongs. They weren't here five years ago. We'll go into those. So some of them are fun. Negligence is an oldie but goodie, substantial understatement, etc. Some of them are new. So the general rule for an accuracy related penalty is you've gotten something wrong enough on your return. And one of these reasons that you're going to have to have a 20% penalty on that underpayment, okay? It's an underpayment of tax, by the way. If you are in a loss position, you don't have a payment issue. That's important. Now, we'll distinguish that from another penalty later. But if you're in a loss position, you shouldn't, they cannot mathematically calculate a penalty because you have no payment. It's when you're in a positive tax position. Okay. They can now, disallow deductions? You know, come at you that way? Yes. You, this, that can all be part of this. Now, we'll go over each of these prongs separately. The general penalty is 20%. In some instances, though, that penalty is 40%. When your accuracy is really, really bad. Okay? <laughs> when you're really, really inaccurate. But it's not fraud. But it's not fraud. You're just, somebody has to smack you a little bit. It's a higher penalty now. And we'll talk about what that higher penalty amount is, okay? Now, if you have an underpayment, uh, or you have an underpayment, um, when the tax required to be shown on the return is different from the tax you showed on the return. That's your differential. There's your underpayment, okay? There is no stacking as we talked about. If more than one prong applies, it's just going to be one 20% penalty. 
Now, sometimes the IRS will throw in a few prongs to make sure something sticks for a rationale, but it's only one 20% penalty generally. Um, it does not apply to any amount for which the fraud penalty applies. If a fraud penalty applies on some amount, that will be the penalty that applies, not the accuracy related penalty or the 40% penalty, because the 75% penalty is more. Okay. And because fraud is there, and that's the penalty that will stick. Also, if a reportable transaction understated penalty applies again, that takes precedence. We'll talk about that later as well. So in the hierarchy, fraud, Reportable transaction understatement and then the accuracy related penalty. The book only has seven. Yes, your book, well, I, I, I might have broken two out. I follow the statute. The book is a little dated on some of these. Some of these are brand new, like the inconsistent estate basis penalty. I don't know if that's in your book or not. That's pretty new. But some of these are newer. I've taken the statute, and that's what okay. you'll see in the slides. Okay. Um, I can't read it, so <laughs> it's okay. And you can send it out. You can print them out. No, you can't cut. We've got, so this is a good row and that's a good row. I will try to read them for you as we go along. It's fine. Okay. Um, anyway, so we'll go through them each separately. But first, Kathy, reasonable cause, that, that yes. has to mean something. What does reasonable cause do for the, all eight prongs of this penalty? Reasonable cause, if one has such a position, um, the penalty can be not assessed or abated if already assessed. Um, I, I think we go into this uh, a, little, a little while about the managerial. Yeah. The statute says actually that no penalty can be assessed to the extent that there is reasonable cause. I mean, that's really sort of the, the policy there. If you have reasonable cause and you've acted in good faith, no penalty on that portion to which there is reasonable cause and good now, faith. Now, the reasonable cause standards, however, are not very low. Okay, the bar is pretty high for that. Um, and the most frustrating thing is that you get agent X will give you a reasonable cause, find it, agent Y will say no way, agent Z will not know what yeah. reasonable cause is. It's, I mean, this is this it's is not the consistent. Yeah. Um, but sometimes you're better off in a live exam getting reasonable cause than you will be if you're writing to a service center. It just happens that way. You have a discussion with somebody sometimes find reasonable cause, okay? Um, if you've disclosed your position, generally you will be able to shelter that portion from penalty if you've disclosed position on the tax return. That will help you um, protect that amount from penalty. How would you disclose that? In a number of ways. There is a ref talk that comes out every year or two or three that tells you what adequate disclosure looks like. Uh, it could be an 8275 form, it could be a white paper, something to let the service know what your position is. So if you have something on your return and you tell the service, we've taken a position on something, we've deducted something, but we wanna let you know that we did do it and you've been clear about it, you should be able to protect that deduction, tax amount on the deduction from penalty. What about a qualified amended return? Qualified amended return is, is a great device if you have filed your tax return, okay, later you find errors on the return that would ordinarily be subject to this penalty, right? Because of negligence or substantial understanding or whatever. But you have gone to the IRS first and filed an amended return and you have fixed those issues under the 6664-4 regulations. The IRS says because you came to us first, you fix these issues. Anything you put in that amended return, which is a qualified amended return, will not be subject to an accuracy related penalty. Fair, right? And during an exam or during the first? A similar process. Under Rev, Rev Ruling or Rev Proc 9469? Rev Ruling, Rev Proc, one or the other. Um, at the very beginning of an exam, if you pony up your you know, less certain issues, ones that could be subject to these penalties. And you're forthcoming with the service right at the beginning. Okay, I don't know if you see this. It was an LBI thing. First question. First question. Anything you pony up. You don't have to agree. You can still take your position that you're right. But if later the IRS does disagree with you, those will be. Or if you have found an error. 
yes. and you're up front with the revenue agent saying, look, uh, that was error. That will be protected from judgment. Same principles. You pony them up. And so there's some fairness rules. Um, accuracy related penalty can only be applied if a return was actually filed. Okay. Um, we discussed what an underpayment looks like. It's the tax required to be shown on the return minus the tax shown on the return and then you're removed. Okay. That's your underpayment. Okay. So let's start with the first prong, negligence. This is the other case, first case that the judge has given you. It was a negligence case. And this was a situation where the taxpayers, I think, deducted something on the return or didn't pick up some income. It wasn't fraudulent. But they had no good reason. It wasn't, we couldn't point to anything that made them forget to put that income on the return or, or double deductions, whatever the case was a few years ago. But the mere fact that they just didn't get it right and they couldn't show any really business diligence or that, they, that there was something extraordinary, we found negligence. IRS, put, IRS had proposed a negligence penalty and we upheld it. We agreed with it, okay? Negligence is any failure to make a reasonable attempt to comply with the rules. And that's pretty broad. Basically, if you get it wrong and you just you don't have anything to point to, you fit with the negligence. Disregard, it can be careless, reckless, or intentional disregard. And we talked about what an intentional disregard might look like. That comes under this prong as well. What is the, what is the difference between careless and reckless? A very fine line. Reckless is a higher degree. I think so. Right? Reckless is is like almost you're just don't you care. appreciate something, but you just blow it off. Careless could be that you're just so, uh, your, your mind is so focused on other stuff, you just don't stop to appreciate what you should. There's grades of it, but none of them reach fraud. That's what this penalty is for, okay? Um, it applies to the portion of the underpayment that's attributable to negligence. So in theory, the IRS would figure out of an underpayment, X is due to negligence. Maybe they figure part of it's not and the part that's due to negligence would be subject to the 20% accuracy of the penalty. Um, it's a, any failure to make a reasonable attempt to follow the rules. If you take a position contrary to an IRS notice um, uh, or revenue ruling, you won't be subject to penalty if you, do you remember the, the chart? I forgot to read it. Uh, do you remember the, the bubbles with the different comfort levels? This is the one oddball time you're going to find realistic possibility of success. The one oddball time you will find it in, otherwise it's substantial authority and reasonable basis, remember? Only here you can get out of a penalty for negligence if you have a realistic possibility of success, about a 33% chance of being right on the position you've taken. Then you can arguably get out of the penalty, but you're gonna have to go argue with the service over that, but that is in the red, okay? It, it's rare. I say the rare time when the standard is other than substantial authority or a reasonable basis plus disclosure. Just that odd ball time. When the IRS proposes a negligence or disregard penalty, the tax court requires the taxpayer to bear the burden of showing that it should not apply. Okay? Um, through reasonable cause, good faith, etc. Sometimes they do, but most of the time they don't. Most of the time the tax court upholds the government on this. They really have to show something. And that something could be that they've gone to an advisor, a reputable advisor, and that advisor told them, take the position I'm telling you I think we're right. And it turned out to be wrong. That could be reasonable cause. Could be. You're going to have to show it somehow, right? Um, and again, the regulations talk about a taxpayer's honest misunderstanding of the law, considering their background. If, Mrs. Stopper and I have an error on our return, we're gonna have a harder time getting out of that. <laughs> but, or even anyone in this room, is gonna have a harder time getting out when they find out we're programmers. But if we go to the folks who are doing a master's in, in art history, they might have an easier time getting out of a penalty under the code because of their background. Um, is it also, it could be an isolated computational error, that could help you too, if the service gets a sense that it was just a mistake. Next problem is a substantial understatement. Now, um, this applies when you have an understatement that is large enough and it doesn't matter why yet. It's mathematical, right? Mrs. Stop. It is what is What is a substantial understatement? 
for non-corporate taxpayers, it's an understatement that, now this, I'm gonna warn you now, the book might be a little off here, this is from the statute, okay? No one will have to compute a substantial understatement on the filing. You don't know what the, what, conceptually what this is, but you will not have to compute it. For individual non-corporate taxpayers, an understatement exceeds the greater of 10% of the tax required to be shown, or 5,000. For corporate taxpayers, it exceeds the lesser of 10% of the tax required to be shown, or if greater 10,000, or 10 million. If it fits conception, or computation rather, within either of those, it is a substantial understatement. And we don't care initially why you have that understatement. The mere fact that it's big enough puts you into a 20% penalty. However, also subject to reasonable cause. Yeah, yep. And it is. You can also reduce this penalty. Professor, yes. is it substantial 25%? I thought that was 25%. You're talking about the limitations period rule, the statute rule. Yeah. When you have, when you extend the statute to six years. Uh -huh. That's why I put that up there. Just as a limitations period is extended from three to six years when you have a substantial omission of income, remember that? Yeah. That's 25% or more of your gross income. Okay. That's the statute rule. In that case, you have a longer statute. Instead of three years, it's six. Here we are talking about a accuracy-related penalty. Different question we're asking. And of course, to make things more complicated, the rules are different. And so this is how we determine whether you are subject to that 20% penalty, okay? Now, give an example here. Lucy taxpayer fails to report $50,000 of income on 1040 for 2018. This results in an additional tax of $30,000, we'll say. The tax originally reported on the return was 100,000, the additional tax due, 30,000, exceeds the greater of 10% of the tax required to be shown, 130,000 times 10, because 130, what was required to be shown, times 10% or 13, it also exceeds 5,000. There is a substantial understatement on her tax return. Okay, start with that. We're gonna get into now whether or not that sticks, but you've got the preliminary determination that there is a substantial understatement and potentially a 20% accuracy related penalty. Now, as Mrs. Stopper said, if there was reasonable cause for good faith, as is in the case of any of these prongs, okay, no penalty can be can be uh, assessed on that portion for which there is reasonable cause and good faith. Okay, uh, it also will not apply if you had substantial authority for the position. Now we know substantial authority, right? If you had substantial authority for the position, no penalty. If you had reasonable basis and it was disclosed, remember, no penalty. And that is where you will see, remember I mentioned the RevProf and how to adequately disclose? There's a new one and it's available at RevProf 2019-9, by the way. So either substantial authority or reasonable basis plus disclosure, though that portion for which you had either one of those is taken out of the substantial understatement calculation. It's just pulled right out, okay? For tax shelter items, you have to have a reasonable belief that it's more likely than not proper, disclosure will not help. If you are more likely than not on a tax shelter item, a transaction with a significant purpose of tax avoidance, that can come out of the calculation as well. Does everybody understand? You got that? This is the substantial understatement, okay? Now, in determining whether there was substantial authority, here's the things you can rely on. Statutes, court decisions, revenue rulings, regulations, Congressional committee reports, private letter rulings, technical advice memoranda, general counsel memos, IRS information or press releases or other announcements. Treatises and things that are private generally are not considered authority for purposes of substantial authority. Although I have my call this evening at 9.15 is, or 9.20 is gonna talk about that issue. Whether we think that <coughs> a letter written by the AICPA is enough for us to take a position. It's not an easy one. Okay. In our case tonight, we are just we are we want to make sure we don't have penalties of the firm on a position. It's a brand new statute that came out in the 2017 law. The only thing out there now are brand new proposed regulations which do not have to be followed. Proposed regulations. And a letter from the AICPA wrote, the proposed regulations are IRS favorable position. The letter the AICPA wrote is taxpayer favorable. This is all we've got. So we have to figure out how we can make sure we don't risk 
accuracy related penalty if we take the taxpayer favorable route. We will talk about that tonight. Why at 9.15, I will never okay. figure out. <laughs> but anyway, it does happen sometimes, right? It does. Yeah. Ah, there we go. I put this here. So back in the comfort levels, I always try to point out. So again, the ones we look at mostly, more likely than not, substantial authority and reasonable basis plus disclosure. That one oddball rule that gets you out of negligence, okay, is if you've got a realistic possibility of success. Again, the only time you're gonna see that. So just get out of a negligence penalty. That's it. Any questions? Substantial valuation mistake. Now this is, again, you're getting something kind of wrong. The IRS can assess penalties where the taxpayer either overstates or understates the value of property depending on what we are looking at. The overstatement or understatement depends on the issue. The penalty applies to the overstatement evaluation of a charitable deduction property, for example. Okay, um, so let's say that you overly inflate the value of charitable contribution properties. You take too much of a deduction. Well, you'll have this, you could have an accuracy related penalty for a substantial understatement too. But you will have a, an overvaluation issue. There's a, the accuracy related penalty addresses that over that inflated value. It could also apply to understating value, like on gifts or estate property. Remember, in an estate and gift tax return, who's had estate and gift taxation? To some of you. The way that estates and gifts are taxed is all the property is put into the pot, and then some tax rate is applied. And it's applied generally to the value of the property. So it would be to the benefit of the taxpayer to push down that value, right? lower the value, the lower the tax. So that penalty goes after folks that push it down a little too much. And if you under or deflate the value of your property that's in an estate or gift tax return, you could do it so much that it triggers that penalty. Yes? So what is the limitation of, or a certain limit? Let's say you have a house or something like that, a piece of property, how much can you, do you know uh, what, how much you can understate the value? We'll get to it. We have this, it's actually percentages that the statute points to. We can work for that. The penalty amount depends on whether it is a valuation misstatement or a substantial valuation misstatement. There's your 20 versus 40%. Okay, you did something bad or really, really bad. The 20% penalty applies to overvaluations that are 200% or more, but less than 400% of the value. So let's go to the charitable contribution deduction example. Let's say you did, you have a hundred thousand dollar value property. You would be able to claim a what kind of deduction? Let me just stop for a hundred thousand dollar property. You claim a charitable deduction of hundred grand, right? Well, it depends, but generally speaking, generally, yes. generally speaking, yes. there's other things that might yeah. lower it, but we'll go with the the, ba the basics. What if you did decide uh, maybe it's two hundred fifty thousand? I think it's valued more. You deduct two hundred fifty thousand. You have now over well, let's see, twenty percent more. Yeah, you have. Now that would be 150 percent, right? Let's say that you deducted um, 350 thousand. That's 250. So instead of deducting 100 thousand for what the property is really closer to worth, you've deducted 350 thousand. You're now over 200 percent of its value. 20 percent accuracy related penalty for valuation misstatement. Let's say you deduct a thousand percent of it. A million dollars. A million one, whatever the number. You're now over 400%, you are in a substantial valuation in the statement territory. 40% penalty. Make sense? Okay. It goes the opposite way also when we are talking about um, deflating the value and estate gift purposes is probably the, the, the place we're gonna see that the most. We look at the opposite. If your undervaluation is 50% or less, okay, so if, if you have a piece of property that should be $100,000 in a gift tax return, but you valued it at, let's say, 45,000. You are looking at a, at a substantial valuation mistake. So you're under 50%. If you are less than 25%, you, you've pushed it down to $20,000, for example, it should be 100. You are looking at a substantial valuation mistake. Okay? Um, so those are the, are the differences there, and we'll go through that in a little, in a little more detail. Yes. 
the Department of Education when you're allowed to have a space for recovery as they were born, where the family or the family can take care of the different houses and things like that. We've got a dear, I don't know if I'm higher, uh, in the case of a charitable contribution, you need to have a place where you see signatures and that kind of thing. Oh. Well, if someone signs to say this is a value of the case, I don't think they can open the open space. They can. Yeah. yeah, they can. One, one uh, case um, that Professor Simmons and I worked on was a charitable contribution case. And she was, sometimes, you know, cases stick with you. I have two in my career, and this is one of them where somebody really did make the charitable contribution of stock. Really did. Made it to a qualified organization, an individual. Did everything right, did everything right, but failed to fill out needed to be incorrectly and have it signed by another person. And the IRS disallowed that. And they put on that accuracy and limited penalty. That the appeals conceded, but that was a tough one. They wouldn't allow the deduction? They did not allow that deduction. Not okay. No, that one was not okay. That was a bad result. It was just not consistent with policy. And Todd and I are like, go to court on this, let's get this. But the taxpayer is like, oh, well, it's just better than I. It's because I think a judge would have been unhappy with the result there and would have done the right thing. Exactly. That's a case when you actually pay and go to the district court or court of claims. District court probably. You will do better in the district court there than the tax court. As I think I mentioned, the tax court tends to take a more institutional view of what its position is in tax administration and will be a little more sensitive to the IRS's position, whereas you go to a district court, couldn't care less. Okay, those judges there are local judges. If they don't like what they see, they don't like a result, they will do the right thing. Because this guy is substantially compliant. Yes, judge will say, this is a, that's a silly result, not gonna have it, you, you get your deduction. And it was, it was not a small deduction. We'll, we'll go through these, we've already gone through them, but again, I've broken these out a little bit. The value of prop, this is for the income tax. It's the substantial, and I have to learn how to spell substantial. Um, <laughs> evaluation of this statement, um, under this is for the income tax, under chapter one, okay? Um, the, va the value of property claimed on an income tax return is overstated, okay, which is where you'd see that on an income tax return, normally the charitable contribution deduction. That's an income tax issue, okay? 20 or 40%, depending on how overstated it is, okay? Um, you know what, that's what I get. I think the rates, these rates are right. Okay, let me go back. This is, this is from your book. I think that's incorrect. I went to the statute and the, and the percentages are here are, are correct here. What is evaluation overstatement to the income tax? 150% or more, but less than 200. They tweaked these very recently. Um, the 20% rate, 200% or more, not 400, 200% 200 or more of the rate is 40%. They brought those down because 400% is way too, it's just way too much. They wanted to, to penalize more quickly. They wanted a penalty to apply to because more of these. I, I think they're thinking more like, you know, you get over 200%, you can't go after, we're gonna fraud. Yeah, yeah, and so they brought those percentages down. That's right, I got, at least I got out of the statute. So, um, that's again, the book is a little bit dated in some places actually communicated with the office. So what is your question? The question is, what's the exam on? My slides in my book? I I would probably put the questions I said for the books is that we go by the slides. We are gonna go by the slides, but I'm gonna fix the other slide before I put it. I don't know, you guys should do your own talk show. We we actually do a lot yeah, we, together. We yeah. when we travel for work, um, we, we we teach a lot. We do webinars. Um, we just did one on statutes of limitation yeah. because we had people making big mistakes on statutes of limitation. Just, just here on the break, somebody sent me an email saying, so uh, "Not a problem." Yeah. Um, so these are the percentages. Same, same principle, same concept. But just remember, these are the numbers um, for the. Ah, okay. So. Substantial overstatement of pension liability that exists if the actuarial determination of the liabilities is for a pension. So pensions, of course, have liabilities for payments in the future, okay? And you take your deduction based on those liabilities, based on your pension liabilities. 
Okay? And if you get those wrong, it's a 20% deduction there as well. Okay? So it's a 200% or more um, difference. So if you are over that 200% threshold, it's a 20% understatement. Okay? I never see the figures. I don't know. I never see uh -huh. the figures. Yeah. Odd ones. I know. But it's part of the accuracy rate. But what this showed you, just under 66.62, look at the stuff somebody can be hit with, you know, as far as penalties, right? Substantial estate and the evaluation understatement. We talked about that, but this is, again, its own prong, okay? The percentages there are, oh, these change also. So again, these are the correct percentages. These, these were just changed. This is right from the statute. Um, it is a substantial understatement if, again, something put on the state or gift tax return, if the value of the property is 65% or less than the amount determined to be the correct valuation. So when you're saying, um, when you're understating something, um, you said pro uh, only property, and you said the state or gift. For the gift, does that gift only or only include property, or does it, it could include any other type of item? Gifts what, gifts can be any kind of property. Okay. Any kind of property. Yeah, okay. that's what you're going to be given. Now, cash is easy because you can't really mess that value up, right? Yeah. But it's other stuff. You know, the, um, my my aunt's beautiful vase. Okay. The one that broke in the brick break. <laughs> Okay, that stuff. I remember the break. Marge is not here. Um, so all that kind of stuff. You know, the car, the antiques, the things that you have to value. When you put, if I'm going to give that as a gift, subject to exclusions and things I'm not going to go over, if it's subject to gift tax, it is to the benefit of the gifter, because that's the person paying the gift tax, to push those values down. Because that's what the basis upon which the tax is assessed. So if you get this wrong, if, if you are, if it's 65% or less, what it should be, you've got a 20% penalty. But if it's really wrong, 40% or less, you've got the 400, the 40% penalty. Okay, that's when you're really, really bad. What if you don't know about the antique? You don't know about the value? You claim it's just, oh, you know, grandma or some grandma gave me the antique. He says, okay, you like it, I give it to you. Get your so, and I'll tell you why. Because then you have reasonable cost. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fair so, answer. <laughs> Answer. So, so we're very, very careful. What about intangibles? Can you give like patents? Gift. I don't know, gift in a way of patents? Why not? Okay. Get it done? Because in okay. intangible yeah. can yeah. have money. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. In the state, the executor, the executor can pick the alternative valuation date, right? Yeah. So in a situation where the state has all stock, and then six months later, the, let's say the stock market crashes, you can totally pick the lower valuation oh, value still yeah. stand. You're following the rule, but, but then you're using the correct value under the rule, right? You're using the alternative valuation yeah. not and, and if the, so what if like, um, everyone understand that principle? On an estate tax return, you can value it on date of death, or you can have used the alternative date, which is six months later. If you have things that are prone to go down in value, that could work to the benefit of the estate tax. Okay. Yes. This does apply that the penalty will be paid by the estate, not by the the taxpayer. So if it's an estate tax issue, then the estate would be the one and the executor would have to. Generally. Yeah. Yes. But the executor, depending on the circumstance. In a gift tax scenario, it's the individual. Well, yeah. In fact, in fact, if you when you extend your if you file an extension on your 1040, they'll ask you to extend your gift tax return too. They go hand in hand. That's only a gift tax. So there won't be a situation where the executor misvalued. Where like he obviously did it incorrectly, mm -hmm. so would the estate then take the penalty, or would he then take the penalty? The estate. It's an estate issue. I would say you'd have to show real yeah. intent and dirty hands. It can be hands. held, but it would have yeah. to be an extreme circumstance. You've got to. Sh you're going to have to have a tape recording of them saying, "I'm going to." I'm going to. Please don't ask because <laughs> mess this up. Our, uh, you know, the guy who wrote uh, Spider-Man and Marvel basically had an estate. James, I was just I was just thinking of that today, and I was wondering what, you know, what kind of, what, what would he have to deal with? Well, once it complex <laughs> cases like that, I'll get back to something on the cheese. Go get evaluation. You may not be right, and I will tell you that that when you bring cases in tax court where valuation is an issue, because that can happen, especially in the state case or a gift case. I, I say the value was a hundred thousand. IRS says it was worth a million. 
well, I'm not going to budge, and they're not going to budge, okay? We go to the tax court. Oftentimes, the courts will battle the experts, and they'll come out in the middle. Okay, it's worth 600. Get that appraisal. It's got to be a good appraisal. You at least, I think, get out of the penalty problem. Because they've gone, got an appraisal, you've done your due diligence. Even if the appraisal is not completely correct, if it's, if it's well-founded, based on the best information it can be, you'll be okay. Alright, so I'm going to update the first one, but these are the percentages you have used now, right? Okay. okay. Um, so let's go back to let's see. Any questions on that problem? Okay. Um, transactions lacking economic substance, a relatively new problem in this penalty. Okay. 2010. That's about right. 2010. Oh, it's a new one. Um, a 20% penalty for a non-economic substance transaction. If it's not disclosed, 40%. There you go. That 20-40 distinction. Bad, really bad. Okay. But not fraud. Um, what's a non-economic substance transaction? Before I, I, I get into what's on there. Um, when I got to the Joint Committee, which was back in 1998, we were starting the, the discussion about tax shelter. It really bothered the Congress and the Treasury Department. The, the taxpayers were out there getting into these transactions that manipulated the tax code, but didn't really change the taxpayer's economic position, right? There was, there was no risk to them. They were just maybe making paper companies, just to have the tax rules work to generate fake losses, things like that. My chief of staff called them slime dogs. That's what they called them. Lots of the accounting firms were doing these. They were all doing these shady transactions that were just paper and generating these, these losses. And courts over time came up with ways to disallow those transactions. Because if you read the actual Internal Revenue Code, and this is beyond, we have to know, but if you read the rules of the code, technically you could, they'd work. You'd get that deduction or you'd exclude that income. Or the, technically, yeah, the rules are written that way to work, but they, they shouldn't work that way because these, these are paper companies or things like that. Because the, the code doesn't take that into account. So courts came up with these doctrines where the court could strike it down and say to a taxpayer, we're not going to give you the benefits you're looking for because there's either no economics to your transaction, you had no real business reason other than tax play. That's where this penalty comes in. This penalty is designed to go after those transactions that just don't pass the smell test. They don't hold water. What's a non-economic substance transaction? It's one that does, that does not change in a meaningful way the taxpayer's economic position. There's nothing there. Or one that has no non-tax purpose. Where's the, where's the non-tax? Where's the business reason for it other than tax play? That's what this penalty is going after, okay? Years ago, I think it's in 2011, the IRS was giving direction to field staff. How do we apply this penalty? Because it was a 2010 penalty. And a year later, they came out with some guidance to the field staff. Dear field staff, okay, which is never what they say. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. Thinking uh, about the dear part. Yes. <laughs> um, we want to help you identify these transactions that could be subject to this penalty. So we're gonna give you a list of about 17 or 18 factors that weigh in favor of imposing that penalty. And I've listed them up here. We've taken that guidance away, but these factors are still very much um, appropriate. And they still are, are good to look at, okay? Go over a few of them. So here's where it might be appropriate, okay? <laughs> This should, uh, you know, this should actually say, this is when the penalty would not be appropriate. Yeah, I mean, this is, must have typed this too late. These are- Can I proofread it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So these 17 factors you could look at through a mirror. 
is really the way to look at it. If you take those factors and just flip them over, you will come into whether or not a penalty should be appropriate. So let's look at some of these. The transaction is not promoted or developed by the tax department versus it being developed by a tax department. If a transaction is not developed by the tax people, it's probably not a tax play. But if it's developed by the tax people, it probably is, okay? If it's not highly structured, it's a simple transaction, IRS doesn't usually worry about those. But if it's highly structured with steps in that are unnecessary, then it starts to get a little fishy. Those steps might be there just to trigger tax code results when you otherwise don't need those steps, okay? Um, it generates targeted tax incentives that, that are consistent with what Congress wanted. We like that, that's okay, probably a, a valid transaction. But if it's taking advantage of code provisions that were not intended, if it's you know, twisting them, that's probably not okay. Um, if it's an arm's length with unrelated parties, we tend to think that things are okay, not shady. We, we respect those. But if it's with related parties, or there's a relationship, we tend to get a little more suspect, right? Um, meaningful economic change we talked about. We like that. That's obviously a non-tax reason for a transaction. But if we don't see that economics, we start to get suspect. Um, Again, other these, so whether credible business purpose, we talked about that. Does it have a meaningful potential for profit or not? If you go into a transaction and you really have a profit motive, we probably think that you have the right reasons for going into it. But if you aren't going into that for any real profit, just for tax play, again, we go back to this penalty. So now you have a good understanding of what this penalty is geared, to, geared toward. The IRS comes in and doesn't think that your transaction is kosher or should be respected, that's a penalty they will look at. If you don't disclose the transaction adequately, that 20% becomes what? 40%, 40%, okay? So when are we there? Disclosure's really important. Yeah, always, always. Disclosure can set you free. And I'm like, my car. like a bumper sticker. You can develop, you know, that clarification later. On my uh, phone call later tonight, I'm going to be approving probably of the transaction with adequate disclosure of the position we want to take. I've already kind of thought about it, and I've had some discussions, and where I think I will end up is. We can take the more aggressive position, which is against proposed regs. Cover your ears over there. Okay. Um, as long as we adequately disclose. Because I think we have a reasonable basis for the position. Okay, CPA agrees with us. It's a brand new rule, and that's my recommendation. So to me, that should get us out of penalties, I would think. I hope so. Okay, well, we've got over enough diesel D in the slide. You'll be able to see it. Well, my company does this, they usually ask KPMG and EY, because KPMG is the auditor, but EY is the consultant. So it's like, here's my position, ballot it out and tell me what you think is right. We had that happen. How many times did we, we get on a call when we're, well, it's the battle of the experts here? Yeah. And we're, people are shopping sometimes. You gotta remember you're all working for the same client, but you get frustrated with each other. They're just like, no, I know better. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Because we know. Well, do you remember, oh, no, we had somebody who had given such poor advice from them before. Did you just get wrong? It was, it was a statute issue. Yes, a statute, oh yes, they filed an amended return. Which is really, oh. what, what did we I consider to be pretty basic. What happens right? when you file an amended return to the statute? Yes, it's done that. They can't do it. Mm -hmm. No. Sorry, what? Uh, what? Let's try again. What happens to the statute limitations when we file an amended return? It starts from the date of the amended return. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing? Nothing? Really? Nothing. That's going to be on the final. Nothing. Nothing. Oh, okay. Thank you. Did you hear every, every class? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing. 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 Generally, when you file an amended return, it has no impact on the limitations period at all. Generally, no impact. That's why it was at least that's it. Generally, it has no impact, except in that 60-day rule. Remember the 60-day rule? Yeah. If you file a, a tax increase within 60 days of the statute end date, 
you get 60 days to assess the item. But somebody from the tax controversy shop of a big four writes in a memo, well, filing an amended return will increase, will, will start the statute yeah, over so something. therefore it doesn't end until 2000 hours. So I'm bringing this into, into Kathy's office. Am I reading this correctly? And we both look at it, we're like, no way. So we immediately got with the team. And because said, that's important. I mean, you're giving huge. client advice on that. That's huge if you miss a statute. And, and from where that person sat, they should know that. They were a manager in that group. You can't put that there unless you know. It was just dead wrong. But on, on the good side, they consulted. Yes. You know, to make sure they were right. So but we, we, we fixed it. Mm -hmm. um, again, now this is a new prom undisclosed foreign financial asset. Form 8918, no, 8938. Yeah. Form 8938 is still from 2010, so it's, it's, it's not even that new anymore. Um, they just updated it, didn't they? I think so. Yeah. The IRS, the, the Congress wanted you to report your interest in foreign financial assets, bank accounts, stock, whatever. If it was a foreign financial asset, you have to report that on Form 8938. If you don't file it and you don't report it, you're subject to penalty for not disclosing on 8938. But you can also have an accuracy related penalty, okay, for an understatement attributable to an undisclosed foreign financial asset. Now that's only undisclosed. Once it's disclosed, you're free from a penalty risk for the understatement. Here, 40% undisclosed, they go together. See how that 40% and undisclosed go hand in hand? Right there. If you do not disclose on 8938, if you have an understatement of your income tax attributable to that asset, and here's your foreign financial assets here, okay? Here's a 40% accuracy related penalty. But they already have the 5471 to cover that. Uh -huh. If it's a foreign corporation. That's a different form. That's I know, but. That's a different penalty. Too. And that's a different penalty. So if they get you for that, they get you for this and for the <laughs> other one too. <laughs> Now you get it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh, if you get anything from this lecture, that is it. That reaction is exactly the reaction. It's fifty percent ownership of a, a foreign corporation. So if you don't file it, you get like a ten thousand right. dollar yeah. penalty. Yes. But then you're also going to fall into this because that's a foreign financial this is for assets into that corporation. That's for individuals. That's for individuals, it's yes. not for corporate? This is individuals. Okay, list it somewhere. But even for people, so they want it for individuals, isn't it? Uh, it can be. Oh, it's your ownership, so it could be either or. Oh, either or. Okay. Yes. If you're considered, what is it, a shareholder or whatever, 50%? Um, controlled foreign corporation? Yes. 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 Um, here, anybody heard of the FBAR form? Yeah. Uh, T, it used to be TD 90-22.1. It's now the FinCEN 114. Yeah. That's, a, that's not an IRS form, that's a treasury form where you are required to report your interest or signature authority over a foreign bank account. They have to be bank accounts, $10,000 or more, right? This was put in as, as the IRS's version of an FBAR because again, that's a treasury form. So they wanted a similar kind of form and that's what they got out of the 8938. Okay, if you don't file it, your penalties are, is it 10,000 or five for not filing the form? 10,000. It's a flat penalty for not filing the form, but that's a penalty for the tax understatement attributable to those undisclosed assets. It's, a, it's another penalty. Those can be stacked. Those can go hand next to each other. Okay? Two separate penalties. Do you see why there's 8938? No. And I never see not, that. Not many penalties. I don't, think, I don't think the IRS is even geared to do this yet. Takes them a while. That would be nice if it had a second option. Yeah, so I don't even see it. But again, reasonable cause will get you out of it. But I mean, it's really hard for them to find out that you have property outside of a country yeah. to begin with, yeah. unless their spouse is pissed, like you said. These countries, they sign a treaty with US or with whatever. Yeah. Information yeah. sharing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. For all the financial activity, all the yeah. people like. You that's know, the all. All people, they, they and even now, that's some the of the BEPS. That's some the, the, that's BEPS, so it's corporation some now for. Some of the tax havens now we have treaties with. That we, it used to be tax havens where you could hide and you mm -hmm. can't anymore. They ask you for driver's licenses, social security numbers, everything. Exactly. They, yeah. they, they require the fill-up form if you're a U.S. Uh, resident or citizen. And uh, what if 
What if um, an, the IRS issues gets a summons to a, a credit card company because they want to know who's got credit cards offshore? Mm -hmm. They don't know your name. What's John Doe. John Doe. John Doe. There you go. So yeah. there you go. See? So they have tools to find you, to just crop up in the air. <laughs> John Doe summons. And bingo. And all you have to do is show up in a John Doe summons at an offshore credit card, and they'll just open the hood on what you got. So, yeah, kind of scary. But anyway, the, the, the lesson there is report everything, and you're fine, right? There you go. Disclosure, that's it. Disclosure, that's it. And the last prong of the accuracy related penalty is an inconsistent escape basis, okay? Now, under 1014, which is a basis statute, okay, it talks about the basis of property acquired from the decedent. When you get basis from a, a, a property from the decedent, you get mark to market. You get to increase it to the market value, okay? Um, but it cannot exceed the final value. You don't get the basis that the decedent had, you get the, the fair market value. There's a reason for that. Because on the estate tax return, they're paying tax at the value. So it's only fair to give the higher basis to the person getting it. Otherwise, there's potential for double taxation. Right, got it? Okay. So the accuracy related penalty here is when the basis of the property claim on a, an income tax return is higher than what, you, what it was determined for estate purposes. Now there's a penalty to go after that problem. When does that generally happen? You just ever see that happen? No. I, I'm trying to think of a scenario where, let's say <coughs> I receive property from the decedent. Let's say I received a, a building and it's worth a million dollars, okay? So if it's worth a million dollars, it was included on their estate tax return at a million dollars. Now I get it, my basis is what? A million dollars. A million dollars. If I were to somehow increase the basis for some reason, I can't think of why I would do that. It's escaping me. I could be subject to that penalty. Is there a re-gifting it? Or no. No, if I'm yeah. keeping it. So I'm, I'm depreciating, let's say I depreciate it now because I'm placing it in service and a business. But instead of depreciating it a million, I say oh, it's worth two million now. I'm sub potentially subjecting myself to this problem. What, is, what happens if you donate it? Well, I could donate it at the same value. I think I still have to use the value I got it at. Well, at the value at time but, of donation. But if, it might but have if you increase your basis in order to, to donate? I, my basis stays at a million, but the value might have gone to a million one when I donate it. And you okay. have a difference, right? Right. Anybody know what that difference is? That 100,000? What could that potentially be? Capital gain. Yeah. It would be, if I'm making a charitable contribution, probably not. It could be a tax preference item for AMT purposes. Mm. The AMT is gone. Okay. Not for individuals. <laughs> uh, I, I only had to pay it once, thank you. <laughs> All right, so here's an example. The seed <laughs> dies in 2016 owning property valued at a million. The beneficiary gets that from the estate. In 2020, the beneficiary sells the property. And setting aside any other adjustments to basis, the beneficiary could be subject to penalty if they claim that that basis was higher. Okay? Because they're now being inconsistent from the Section 1014 estate basis. That's what that penalty goes, goes to, got it? It's another accuracy related penalty. You have just finished the accuracy related penalty prompt. Congratulations. That is amazing. Yeah. And there's so many more penalties. <laughs> you want to start? You can start no. this one and we'll all chime in. This is the... Oh, this is yours. Oh, God. I gotta tell you, he's very modest. He wrote this book. <laughs> Not this book, a different book about reporting. If I wrote this book, it would have been 100% accurate. Um, <laughs> and I would have proofread it. <laughs> yes, I would have made that spell mistake. Yeah, an occasional spell mistake, that's right. Well, I spell like Elizabeth did, so. <laughs> I forewarned you. Um, so we talked about reportable transactions and we talked about large case exams, right? Yep. We talked about those already. Remember what they are. There are those, those five categories of transaction that we have to report separately, specially, transparent, okay? Well, there's a host of penalties that apply just to those transactions for failing to disclose them or for understatements attributable to them. Special accuracy-related penalties, almost, they're not called that, for understatements, we'll go over those, okay? So, the reportable transaction regime has their own penalties, and we'll start with the disclosure penalty. 
Okay, right here, failing to disclose. Under 6707 cap A, the failure by a taxpayer to disclose their participation in a reportable transaction is subject to a penalty. Okay, that penalty is generally 75% of the decrease in tax shown on the return as a result, as if the transaction were respected. So you would look at the transaction that is the reportable transaction, and you would ask yourself, what would be the tax change as a result of this penalty? The penalty then would be 75% of the potential decrease in tax. That would be for failing to disclose that transaction on 8886, okay? The maximum penalty for a listed transaction only, that one category of the, the IRS is 36 most wanted, that maximum penalty is pretty high, $200,000 or 100,000 for people. If it's not a listed transaction, 50,000 or 10,000 for people. Push down, just kinder, gentler on that. The minimum penalty, there's, it, it, there's a floor, 10,000, 5,000 for people, okay? That's the failing to disclose the penalty. Again, I'm not going to make you calculate a penalty on the file, but this is the way that that's failing to disclose. Have you ever seen an 8886 failure to disclose? Likely, but not, not often, certainly. Um, I will tell you, to get out of it, you have, it's, it's very difficult to get out of this penalty. It's not your typical reasonable cause. It's called rescission. You have to actually submit the briefing paper to the government asking for permission to get out of this penalty. It's, it's very, very difficult. On the other side, there's an accuracy-related penalty for understatements attributable to those transactions, okay? It's a reportable transaction understatement. And this is not every reportable transaction understatement. It's only certain reportable transaction understatements, okay? Um, it is the sum of, well, now this, I'll go into the formula in a second, but basically, I think if I have it, your reportable transaction understatements are going to be understatements attributable to listed transactions, transactions of interest, or the other ones with a significant purpose of tax avoidance. It's your higher level, more egregious transactions. Those are the ones that if you have an understatement on your return, could be subject to this accuracy related penalty instead of the other one. Same 20%, okay, but it's this penalty. There is a difference here though. Where, remember I told you on the accuracy related penalty you actually need an underpayment of tax? Like if you're at zero, there's no underpayment. Different here. This can actually apply to a change in an NOL. They designed this one to be a little more harsh. So this one could apply to the swing in an NOL number. Okay. This penalty is increased to 30% if not disclosed. Not 40, 30% if you don't disclose it, okay? So if you have a reportable transaction understatement, 20% um, if you disclosed it, 30% if it's not disclosed. Questions about this one? Uh, this one I know is yours, but yeah. we'll let you <laughs> take this one. Failure to file tax return. We all know tax returns are due on their due date, no if, and, or but. I will tell you that the IRS has a special grace period in there for it does, but it's been redacted, so it really doesn't. Um, for those taxpayers who fail to file their tax returns on time and there is an underpayment, there is a failure to file penalty of 5% a month not to exceed 25%. It can be really um, quite costly for taxpayers if they owe, I don't know, let's say 100 grand, and they have failed to, to file their uh, tax returns on time. That's, uh, that's a lot of money. So if they fail to file their tax return on time, let's, let's say they think they filed an extension, but they didn't, right? And they don't file their, it's due 415, they don't file their tax return until 1015. What kind of failure to file penalty do you have on that? 25%. You've got 
let's say that they did file their tax return on time, and we'll get to this other one, but um, in a second, they did file their tax return on time, but they didn't pay their $100,000. Then what happens? Then they only have the failure to pay penalty, right? But what happens if they failed to file on time and did not pay on time? Then what happens? You've got a failure to file and a failure to pay tax, right? The failure to pay tax is also not to exceed 25%. However, and I think the book was not clear enough on this, when you have both the FTF, an acronym, FTF, failure to file, and an FTP, failure to pay, when you have them running concurrently, the failure to file penalty is reduced by the half a percent of the failure to pay penalty. But this is where the book is, I believe, is not clear enough. Sketchy. Sketchy. Only for the first five months. Oh. Okay. So, yeah. So it needs to be a little clearer. Because on by that. then your failure to file is maxed out. Right. So your total penalty that can be assessed if you've not paid is 47.5% if you're running concurrently, not 25% and 25%. Because you saved the 2.5% for the five months that they ran you. Right. Half percent times five. That's yes. your savings from savings. Did you happen to go into extensions at all? We talked about it. Okay. Um, the failure to file a penalty, while we don't see it often, certainly can happen. On a form 704, let's say in the case of a corporation, extension, extension, they're required to make payment of their tax with that extension, right? What happens if they don't? They have to pay 90% of Yes. 90% of a corporation's tax must be paid in by April 15th for a penalty year. Or the IRS can consider that extension to be invalid, but what happens if they don't file their tax return until 1015? And the IRS says, hey, you didn't pay the tax and your extension's now invalid. They yeah. also get the failure to file. That can be huge. That's for corporations only. Yeah. yeah, individuals, if they don't pay it, but it didn't always, it wasn't always that way. They changed it. Yeah, individuals used to have uh, the same uh, penalty. So what if um, you don't have a friend who's helped you calculate it right, properly? They are just, you know, a little bit, maybe the data was gathering not properly, or maybe the taxpayer was missing a piece of information. Mm -hmm. So for the 90% is a little bit under. So that will trigger the invalidation of the extension. And so it can be still invalid then. That means for the debtor, you're still um, obligated to pay the yeah, oh, you, And I tell, I'll tell you why, because we were talking about this earlier. The IRS um, often depends a, a, upon a case called the Boyle case, which says a taxpayer cannot delegate his tax filing or paying obligations, which means you can, you're not supposed to rely upon their preparer. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, we fight this Well, especially with electronic lot. returns. We have to file them electronically. Taxpayers don't do it that often, so they're, they're a little more sensitive to that, but we're still stuck yeah, with Yeah, we, we are. We, we're still getting uh, the Boyle um, case a lot from our uh, penalty book when we're not. So yeah, so in 1996, they made it easier for individuals and basically said, look, individual, we want you to file your returns. So get your extensions in, even if you pay zero. Will respect your extension. Just file them in. Get your return filed afterward, and you are not facing the harsh failure to file. All right. Here we go again. Filing a frivolous tax return. I had a client last week who got a notice from the frivolous return unit in Ogden Service Center, um, having something to do with the fuel tax credit. It's a 2015 return, and he's now just getting a letter. I'm like. 
this can't be good. <laughs> so I called them. This is the truth. Called them. The tax return was processed back in 16. We've all already filed an amended return. Everything's been done. I thought everything was done, right? They wanted verification of the fuel tax credit claim of $11,080. Not kidding. So we say to the client, hey, you have your receipts, you know, IRS wants this. They send me the receipts. I call Miss IRS and I say, I have the receipts. How would you like? It's 513 pages <laughs> for an $11,000 deduction. So yeah, because it's based on gallons, right? And based on a, a, a thing of 50 or 50 cents on a gallon, That's something right. like that. Yeah. So, I, I give it to him with no tax, just here's your 530. <laughs> so anyway, they simply said, well, could you do a monthly summary and just let us know what was... No, just I wouldn't. I'd say, here's your 530 days. <laughs> 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 That's because you're not as nice as I am. I did the summary. It's in. Done. I, but, again, I'm not civilian exam. We don't create documents. Right. Unless it benefits us and we, we then are clear when we, we create it. This one, I would just say take it. But I think they see that 513 pages, they just decide to go to fuel summary. That's it. Yeah, yeah. If you, exactly. They, they could have sampled it. I think they would say, you know, I need to support. But, but my point was for $11,000. But apparently there were people filing um, frivolous uh, tax returns with this fuel uh, credit on it. So they made some sort of project out of it. Okay. So again, there's a penalty. If it's a specified frivolous submission, $5,000. So if you file a frivolous return, but bogus position, bogus, it means it's garbage. They can hit you with a $500 penalty. If it's one of those issues on their list, $5,000. And this would come up without the citizen of California, not of the United States, will have to pay tax. Right. You, I mean, this is you, the silly. You have your tax protesters, so on and so forth, saying, you know, there's nothing in the law that says I have to pay tax, that type of thing. We have people who file returns that are just blank, you know, saying, you know, the United States doesn't have I have a story. jurisdiction. You have a story? For the second one, okay. the tax court can impose up to $25,000 for frivolous position. And oftentimes it's, I'm not a citizen of the United States, I'm a citizen of California. Or whatever, they always pick California. <laughs> like, you, know, you, know, you know how the West Coast is. So, um, Somebody and the court has the discretion to go up to twenty-five thousand. So we had a taxpayer. This is one of those early cases. The judge had written this opinion and sent it to me and his other clerk. So he wanted to discuss the opinion and get our thoughts on it. Well, this was the second guy, the guy's second time back with the same argument. The first time, the judge had hit him with a five thousand dollar penalty. The second time, the judge had had proposed and put in the draft opinion another five thousand dollar penalty. So I get this and I look at it and I said, this is the second time back. And the judge said, yep. I said, that penalty should be $25,000. Judge goes, yeah, you're right. Alrighty then. <laughs> Change it from five to 25,000 because it was the second time he was back right. with the same garbage argument. And the, you're wasting time with the judges at this point. And, and when, when real tax payers or real issues can come up with it. So, we got them with the highest amount because it was a second visit. So, you gotta be careful with your frivolous position. Okay, failure to file information right. returns or provide correct information on those returns. Typically, we see where a taxpayer has um, either not timely filed W 2s, 1099s, that type of thing, or there's a TIN tax ID number um, name mismatch. Tax ID number doesn't match the name on IRS records, so that's a problem. Um, sometimes there's a simple typographical error. IRS sends out those uh, penalty, proposed penalty adjustment notices, usually at the end of August, not for the most recent year, but for the year before that. So in trying to get some of that information and the documentation that can be um, quite cumbersome on taxpayers. And then what happens, think about it. Let's say I file a W-2 for Professor Simmons here and I've got his SSN wrong and I filed it for 2016, right? 
So in 2018, in August, the IRS says, hello, lady, this SSN is wrong and we're gonna charge you a penalty. But what happened with this 2017 file? I've used the same number, right? Associated with the name, but I didn't know it was wrong. And so that creates a real problem with some of these information requests. I think this, this penalty amount is wrong now. It's 260 per occurrence. That's a recent change. So when this came into effect, where it was 100, a lot of people had a problem with that anyway. But now that it's 260, you know, they're really, and I think it may be going up for inflation again. The IRM has that, has that in it. Um, these can be Philadelphia Service Center handbills, these, by the way. So it can be very um, um, voluminous in paperwork to hand to them. And we've handled uh, quite a few of these. I think um, we do a really good job as far as providing documentation. There are certain, certain information um, um, documents that an employer must get, or a, uh, uh, in the case of a vendor, that the uh, company must get information like your W-9s, things like that. So if you, um, if a lot of you read e-file, you eat, it normally you check up on it, right? Like if uh, the ID is not correct or W-9. Well, if, if you're talking about like an income tax return, that'll be rejected, but not on an information uh, reporting basis, unless there is some other error uh, the IRS has a system called a fire system where they file electronically. That's also another kind of separate penalty. And so there's a penalty for everything, right? Just everything. Um, but we've had some good cases where they've tried to prove to the IRS, we tried to file electronically and it just didn't work. So we've been successful with those as well. The IRS's point in these penalties is they really want the people to pay the taxes on, on the information returns. Professor Simmons has talked about matching programs with the IRS too, right? So if I file an information return that's got his social on it, but it's the wrong social, and that social belongs to you, when the IRS does their matching, they're gonna say, hello, why didn't you report this $500,000? And you're going to say it doesn't belong to me. Well, who does it belong to? So the IRS has some pretty strict penalties when it, when it comes to that sort of thing. Uh, reasonable cause does apply. Okay. Um, the electronic, it's got to be 250 um, required to be filed elect electronically at least. If you have um, 275, let's say they will only charge the penalty on the extra 25 on that. Um, we talked about estimated uh, tax penalties a little bit, 6654, 66.55. And you brought up um, a good um, argument for the new tax law and the new change in the estimated tax penalty assessment. What is I think it's eight estimated percent. tax penalty is different. This is more of Some people call it an interest. It really an is underpayment more penalty interest is during, during the year. It How is. is this different from debtor to debtor? Well, it's, it actually is an interest copy. The estimated tax penalty is computed in the same way interest would be computed on the required installment up to the return due date. Okay, that's how that's done. So a lot of people consider that to be an interest because for that but year, when you would be making estimated payments, there's no interest. Instead, it would be an estimated tax penalty. Correct. So that's how because you can't it. have interest before the due date of a return. So instead, so that's they call how they it an estimated it. tax penalty, but it's really operating as your interest charge. Then when the due for date, failure to to timely pay your installment. Once that right. due date hits, no more estimated tax penalty. It's now interest, interest and interest failure to pay. pay. Right. So that's what that's what changes. Exactly. And there is no reasonable cause position for an estimated tax uh, penalty. But there are some other um, um, nuances in trying to get a penalty like that, either reduced and or abated. 
you can, in fact, uh, when you file a 2220, you can file amended 2220s or 2210s if you find that they're incorrect or you otherwise want to uh, annualize or seasonalize or, or something like that. So you, computation, you can reduce yes. an estimated tax penalty if you show the math is wrong. Correct. For corporations, that's it. For individuals, there's, there's a small window. Yep, very small. Of not reasonable cause, but sort of equity. Yeah, exactly. Timely deposit. These typically we see these on 941 accounts where somebody doesn't make a, a timely deposit. Also, perhaps a 1042. Of employment taxes, so you're not. There's three kinds of penalties employment taxes could be subject to. Yes. And that's failure to file, failure to pay, of course. Plus this failure to deposit. Correct. Correct. The withholding is definitely there, right? For the 1042s. For the 1042s, so you have to do withholding, and sometimes, depending on the payment, is three business days. It's depending on the payment, it could be the next business day. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Oh, I think it's 100 grand is the next business day, and um, you know sometimes people just um, don't do it right. Also, though, your Schedule B on your 941, if your record of federal tax liability is wrong, you can amend that as well. And again, I see when I do the analysis because. On those IRS internal transcripts, okay, they're going to have your record of federal tax liability in that transcript. And I have seen it where the input dates have been wrong, which means what? Your deposit date, right? The penalty is, is being assessed because the IRS input your, your liability date wrong. So um, if somebody has an FTD penalty, that could be a reason to, if they really know their, their deposits were uh, the 10%, you're right, we see that rate most often. Um, and we, we can always spot that too, because whenever you get a notice and you know that the payroll taxes were 250,000, received 25,000 dollar penalty, you've got a failure to deposit penalty. Right, Easy. exactly. Prepare penalties. Oh. Yeah, um, this one's really easy. This is, um, these have been around for a while, but they changed it back in 2007. These are assessed on preparers. When preparers get things wrong, it's like an accuracy related penalty, but on the preparer. Remember the, the comfort level chart in the bubbles? Here's where it applies on a preparer. Okay, this is what a preparer is subject to. Similar to what a taxpayer would do. Same comfort levels, okay, except for that realistic possibility of success at the place, not right. Okay. So in this instance, um, the 6694 penalty is the preparer penalty. It's assessed usually after there's a preparer examination. What will happen is the IRS will come launch an exam of the preparer, and they might get wind of that when they're doing a taxpayer's exam, and they'll see that there's been enough errors on a taxpayer's return, who's the one who prepared it? And they might go after the preparer. Okay, that might be what launches this preparer exam. It only applies where the return preparer meets the definition of a preparer, okay? And it's one who prepares a return for compensation or employs others to do that, okay? That's a preparer. It applies to where the preparer knew or reasonably should have known that there was an understatement of tax due to an unreasonable position. What is an unreasonable position? One for which there is not substantial authority or if disclosed reasonable basis, right? Same as taxpayer. Um, if, it, if it's due to willful attempt or an intentional disregard of rules or regulations, that's really bad. Penalty is the greater of a, of a thousand or fifty percent of the income derived by the preparer. You'll see this is a different amount. This penalty amount was changed in 07 when Congress, rather than these flat penalty amounts, started to go after the fees. They were looking to prepare money now. So that's where you get this kind of off the wall thousand or fifty percent of the fees the preparer was going to derive from that engagement. That's a relatively new concept. It's a relatively new, newly revised penalty. If there was fraud or willfulness, it was 5,000 or 75% of the income. And that could be a lot, it could be a whole lot. Okay? But that's what the prepare penalty looks like. But the worst part about the prepare penalty, though, is the um, Office of Person, uh, the um, Office of Professional Responsibility referral. 
people can get past the fees, the, the, the penalty charge, you don't want your name on that list. That's hard. That's, that's really career limited. Um, now, a preparer, again, is one who prepares for compensation a substantial portion of the return. You can be a signing preparer or a non-signing preparer. Okay? The signing preparer generally is the one that signs the return, but the non-signing preparer does not sign the return, um, but prepares all or substantially all of the return um, or claim for refund or a particular area of the return or be a position on the return. You can be the non-signing preparer as to some part of the return, and so you, any potential prepare penalty would be on the shoulders of that non-signing prepare. Okay, the regulations provide a portion of the return is not considered substantial if it involves gross income or deductions that are either less than 10,000 or less than 400,000 and also less than 20% of the gross income. Sort of a, a de minimis threshold there. Um, ministerial acts are generally not going to be considered prepare issues like typos, envelope stuffing, and things like that. So that's nothing that alone gets you into prepare penalty. Um, IRS cannot assess the penalty against both signing and non-signing preparers within the same term. We would look at who's primarily responsible for the return for the position. Okay. Um, no penalty, again, is adequate disclosure or reasonable basis. These are appropriate penalties. Just have you seen any? And, and actually, this one is is easy um, um, to forget. Sometimes you get somebody who forgets to sign a return and prepare, and so they're subject to a penalty, and not because of willfulness or anything like that, but just for one reason or another, forgot to. You can tell how little these are, how old these are. Yeah. Well, yeah, by the amount. Now, remember, negotiation of check was a circular 230 problem. That was the bigger problem. This is the up the counter part. You negotiate your client's check. It's a small thing. So we don't care about the penalty. We care about the circular 230. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be promoting abusive contracts. That's that's the key. Yeah, that that would be a little large. Yeah. yeah. Promoting what you do then. Fact check. We don't see this around. No. Nobody's doing these anymore. No, really. not anymore. In the 80s, perhaps. Just don't see these penalties. No. Right. But I know for a fact that there is there's an earned income credit. There. Earned income credit? Oh, there's sure. I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. And those folks for whom it has been disallowed, I believe, are they're not allowed to claim it for, I don't know, yeah, it's not a year. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly. Discussion. Yeah. Right on time. Right on time. We have a few minutes, so. Yeah. Any questions? I will probably have these posted in the next few days, maybe over the weekend. Make um, it pretty. Do you want us to set it to music? <laughs> <laughs> no, but if I, we can't trust the book, and it's only your notes.